Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Hey, wildlings. Every animal fears its predators. This is true for obvious reasons. We also identify those predators instinctively, be they of an alien form to us or one of our own. Predators, however, recognize this tendency and so develop camouflage and lures. You'll see, it's all in the story. There's an ice cream truck in my neighborhood. If you're a kid too, don't go near it. By certain emergency 122 from Reddit's No Sleep. All the kids in my neighborhood know the story about the ice cream truck. It's not a nice one. We do try to tell our parents about what the ice cream truck does to kids, but it's like talking to a brick wall. If you breathe a word of the story to them, they'll simply freeze in place, their eyes glazing over and unblinking, smiles stretching over their faces. It isn't until you give up, feeling completely disheartened and alone, that your parents emerge from their trance, looking puzzled. They'll pat you on the head or the shoulder and ask, what were you saying, kiddo? So, you see, we can't tell our parents or any other adults about the ice cream truck. It won't let us. I hope the same thing won't happen to you. If you're an adult and reading this, I'm sorry if it does, truly sorry. But I need to warn the other kids. Don't move here to Adaport. The story goes like this. There's this kid named Roger, 10 years old, maybe 8, or maybe as old as 16. Depends on who's telling. Roger strolls along the street on his way to school, or maybe on his way back from it. He walks without a care in the world, swinging his backpack. He's whistling because it's a fine, beautiful, sunlight-strewn day, and then Right as he's nearly reached his destination, he hears it. A strange, but cheerful jingle. He starts to smile because he can't help it. That ice cream truck jingle is the kind of sound that makes kids laugh, puts a pep in their step, makes them think about people or things that they love. Roger thinks about his parents and the stack of superhero comics on his desk. And while he's thinking of all these delightful things, he slows down. You don't want to do that when the ice cream truck is around. The source of that jingle rounds the corner and barrels straight at him. Roger sees that it's an ice cream truck. It looks like something you'd see in hell, he thinks. Then he scolds himself. Where did that stupid thought come from? No, that ice cream truck doesn't look scary at all. It, it looks fun. Bright shapes decorate every inch of it. As it approaches Roger, he looks at it more closely and realizes that there are superheroes all over the truck. Superman, Batman, Captain Marvel, The Flash. He's amazed. He's never seen an ice cream truck decorated like that before. Strike that. He's, he's never seen any vehicle decorated like that. The ice cream truck has no name, but he's sure the owner's a great guy. Someone who loves comics as well. Roger walks over to the truck as it slows down next to him. He can't help it. Someone else has control of his legs now, and they mean for him to come to them. He walks over to the small shuttered window where they normally serve the ice cream, and then the door to the truck opens. There are multiple endings to this story because no one ever agrees on what exactly happens when the door opens except for one thing. Roger disappears, and he's never seen again. Back then, I thought that story was a huge load of crap. An ice cream truck. Really? That was one of the least frightening things that I'd ever heard of. Anyways, I was dealing with enough problems at school. I didn't need to expend energy worrying about some dumb ice cream truck. <laughs> Richard Golden led the pack of my bullies. I still don't know why he hated me so much, and maybe it was because of my height, or my annoying high-pitched voice. Either way, he set out to destroy my life. Which wasn't a surprise, because 
I'd been bullied before at other schools. The new kid was always an easy target, and bullies gravitated towards me like bees to honey. Richard wasn't dumb enough to do anything life-threatening, but in some ways, the petty shit was almost worse. It meant that none of the teachers took me seriously when I complained about what was going on. Boys will be boys, my world literature teacher said indulgently. I had to constantly watch my back, and my front. Actually, I had to keep my head on a swivel. I never knew when he and his sycophants would strike. They tried to trip me whenever they saw me walking down the hallways or cafeteria. If I brought lunch from home, they either stole it or ruined it. They shoved me into lockers, knocked me upside my head, muttered insults at me. If I didn't keep a death grip on my backpack, they stole that too. They would pass it around to each other, laughing hysterically as I tried to save my homework, my textbooks, and my pencil pouch. If you've ever been bullied, then you understand. School was hell, and just like my teachers, my parents didn't take it seriously. I knew that my dad was disappointed in me. He wanted me to be tougher, stronger, to be a man. I'd heard him talking to Mom late at night when they both thought that I was asleep. Why isn't William like the other boys his age? All he does is read. My mom had hushed him, but she shouldn't have bothered. My dad and I had always had an uneasy relationship. All this to say, when I went to school on Friday morning, I braced myself for the usual bullshit. But I entered my first period math class to find everyone looking somber and subdued. It was eerie to be surrounded by so many pale, silent faces. They looked up at me when I entered the room, then looked back down to their desks. Many of them were sitting very still, not doing homework or chatting with their friends, but just staring off into space. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I leaned over to my deskmate, Sarah, and whispered, What happened? Now, Sarah only sometimes deigned to speak with me. It wasn't out of arrogance, but fear. Nobody wanted to be my friend because nobody wanted to become the new target of Richard's sadism. Now, she turned to me with wide eyes and said, He's been missing for nearly 15 hours. His parents called the police station and said he'd never showed up. Couldn't have happened to a nicer person, I thought. But I still wondered why everyone looked so stricken. Richard had never been that popular. I was pretty sure most of us hated and feared him in equal measure. And then I heard it. Someone behind us said, It's the ice cream truck again. Sarah whipped her head around to glare at the offender, Emily. She was a quiet kid and didn't usually speak. Now she fidgeted in her seat, drumming her fingers on her desk and periodically looking at the doorway as if she longed to escape. Don't be an idiot, Sarah said sharply. There is no such thing. It's not real. Personally, I agree. The ice cream truck story was just that, a story. It was far more likely that Richard had simply run away uh, though he wasn't really the type to do that. Maybe a pedophile had kidnapped him or a serial killer? I didn't wish that fate on anyone, but I'd be lying if I said that there wasn't some small part of me that thought Richard would deserve it. We all stopped talking when Mrs. Auden entered the classroom. She glanced around at us, her eyebrows raised as if she was puzzled by such an extraordinary feat of silence but she didn't ask us what was going on. Richard's parents had probably already contacted the school. The math lesson simply continued on as usual. That entire school day was a blur for me. I'd be alert on the lookout for shoves and teasing, and then I'd remember that Richard was missing and I didn't have to constantly scan my surroundings anymore. Without Richard around, the usual pack of bullies had dissipated, some of them glumly eating by themselves in the cafeteria. That day was probably the best day that I'd ever had at school. 
everyone left me alone. I started to think that maybe it wasn't such a bad thing if Richard was, you know, incapacitated for a while longer. I didn't exactly want him dead, but I was enjoying the peace and silence of his absence. When the school bell rang, for once I didn't have to speed out of there like a bat out of hell. Instead, I walked slowly and calmly, enjoying the sunshine that had made a sudden reappearance. Winter in NorCal only lasts for all of two weeks, but I had gotten spoiled by the good weather. The temperature was in the high 50s and a brisk wind swept over me. It was perfect weather for my walk back home, a trek that usually took around 30 minutes. As I walked home, I shuffled through the playlist on my iPod. Nine Inch Nails Into the Void blared through my earbuds, and I relaxed. I loved rock and heavy metal. Unsurprisingly, my dad disapproved. Right as Into the Void switched over to a different song, I heard a strange noise. I still had my earbuds on, but I could almost hear it. Maybe it was someone blasting music from their car, or someone practicing drums in their parents' garage or basement. I hesitated one hand over my left earbud. Curiosity got the better of me. I lowered my earbud and a blast of sound hit me. I don't know how to describe what I heard otherwise. It was one of those melodies that gets trapped in your head, but no matter how hard you try, you can't recreate it. You'll try to hum it or play it, and whatever comes out of your lips or fingers just doesn't match up to what's in your head. It was even more than that, though. The melody I heard somehow had multiple dimensions to it. Sight, smell, taste, different senses. As I listened, I could see that the melody was a carnival. Not like or reminded me of a carnival, it was a carnival. As I stood there, unmoving, my head tilted to one side like a bird mesmerized by a snake, I could see the performers in colorful costumes, running around on their stilts. I could even smell the popcorn, taste the cotton candy. It was so real to me that I began to chew on it. The taste of blood in my mouth brought me back to myself. I had bitten the inside of my bottom lip, not as badly as I could have, but bad enough that when I ran my tongue over it, I could feel blood pooling in the indentations of my teeth. I looked around myself wildly, like a dreamer who had just woken from a nightmare, and I saw where the melody came from. An ice cream truck. It had no name on its side, but it rolled towards me slowly, and I couldn't tear my eyes away from it. It was beautiful, breathtaking. I thought of my mom then because she painted in her spare time. It was one of the hobbies that we bonded over together that disgusted my dad so much. The way the colors swirled over the truck reminded me of our favorite painting, Somewhere New by Linda Woods. It also made me think irresistibly of ice cream. The colorful yellow and pink and orange swirls of sherbet rainbow ice cream. Then I walked toward the ice cream truck. It waited for me, the engine rumbling strangely loudly, and the door opened. And I saw who owned the ice cream truck. For an instant, long, black-gray arms reached out for me, and then I blinked, and an old man stood in front of me. His arms held out in welcome. He had strangely bony hands on his wrist, but his bright blue eyes twinkled with warmth and welcome. I smiled back at him, and he was so hunched over that we were nearly of equal height. Hello, young man. My name is John Goodman. Would you like some ice cream? I nodded and began to walk forward. The open door yawned behind him, and into darkness. There was a moment of unease, and then I told myself not to be silly. I could trust Mr. Goodman. He was my friend. And a sharp pain pierced my right ear, the one with the earbud still in it. The wretched 
screeched into my ear and I instinctively tried to lower the volume. The iPod slipped through my fingers and hit the ground and I started to bend down to pick it up and then froze. The old man's face flickered. One second he was a kind, gentle man reaching out to help me pick up my iPod. The next something monstrous. It towered over me and had multiple stick-like arms and legs. That was the first thing I noticed. The next was that its enormous body was rotting. It looked and smelled the way spoiled meat does, and every time it moved forward on those thin legs, flakes of skin drifted off from it. Worse though, worse than its insane white eyes and its gaping mouth were the faces. Faces covered every part of its body and arms and legs, and all of them were screaming. Faces of kids whose eyes rolled madly in their sockets, whose black tongues flapped out, and whose shredded lips formed incoherent shapes. I saw Richard's face on one of its arms, and he saw me. We stared at each other for a full second, and... Then I scrambled backwards as the thing's hands reached out for me, its black talons grasping for my face, my clothes, my arms. I screamed in one startled burst and then started to run, and as I ran I heard it behind me screaming too. But unlike mine, its was a scream of frustrated rage. I risked a backward glance and saw that it slumped down beside the ice cream truck, beating its many arms against the ground in a fit of petulance. The faces of the kids on its arms wailed as their faces smashed apart, bits of bones flying through the air, noses and eyes and lips gouged out to bleed down their cheeks. Once I got home, I went straight to my room and I locked that door. I barricaded it with my bookcase and my desk. I even pushed my bed against it. If I'd have had anything else to put between myself and the door, I would have used that too. I sat in the middle of my wrecked and messy bedroom and trembled and waited for the thing to track me down and kill me. My parents came home and my dad forced me to undo the barricade. We ate dinner together and the food was ash in my mouth. As usual, dad ignored me except to tell me that it was rude to wear earbuds during dinner. I took them off, but I kept them in the pocket of my hoodie. My mom, though, she noticed that I wasn't my usual self. As we watched TV together, the images swirling into a colorful mess before my eyes, she touched my forehead. What's wrong, Will? That was all it took. A dam broke inside my chest, and even though I was worried that she'd cart me off to a mental hospital, I told my mom everything. I finished with... I think it got Richard, the guy who gives me a hard time at school. What should we do? Complete silence. I lowered my hands from my face, and my mom had the strangest expression on her face. She was so still that she looked like one of those store mannequins poised behind the storefront window. And finally, she moved again. Her eyes began to blink and her mouth stretched into a yawn. I'm sorry, honey, what were you saying? Nothing, I replied, my chest hollow. I, uh, I think I'm coming down with something. I excused myself to bed and barricaded my bedroom door again. Thankfully, I hadn't lost my iPod. I picked it up from where it was charging and slipped the earbuds from my pocket into my ears. There was no way in hell that I was ever taking them off again. It wasn't until I was close to falling asleep that I heard it. A cheerful, lively melody, so loud that I could almost hear it over the music in my buds. But I kept turning up the volume on my iPod, even when it hurt so badly that I would have given anything to turn it off. I stood up and sprinted over to my bedroom window, looking down. As expected, the ice cream truck was parked outside on the street, waiting for me. Moonlight turned its bright spirals of colors into a cruel, mocking joke. 
And the longer that I stared at the truck, the easier it became to see that the colors weren't really there. No, the truck was decorated with small bones. Made from them, actually. Bones glimmered in their spirals under the moonlight and jutted out from the truck. And although I knew it was just my imagination, it seemed to me that I could hear the screams of the children again. Someone screamed my name over and over. It sounded like Richard. But he could scream as much as he wanted to because I wasn't going down there, not if I could help it. I knew that there was something in the ice cream truck looking up at me, its white eyes gleaming as drool dripped down its chin. Something waited for me to take out my earbuds, waited for me to make a single mistake, waited for me to come outside. Something hungry. So yes, we know kids aren't stupid. Children do have wondrous imaginations, but they also know when a real threat exists. So it might not be the worst idea to learn how to listen, as well as to teach. Stay scary, wildlings. Keep wary of unearthly sensory input and hellspawned mercantile vehicles, and make the most of your nights.